evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, we seem to have a few spare seats, so if you want to come a little bit closer so you can hear us better, um, you might enjoy that. <laughs> I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land where we gather today and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. I recognize their connection to country and their role in caring for and maintaining country over thousands of years. Thank you. On behalf of the Lowy Institute OzPNG Network project, uh, I'd like to welcome you to this panel discussion tonight where we'll be discussing digital innovations in health, sport and agriculture uh, and education uh, in Papua New Guinea. And we're pleased to have three of our 2022 OzPNG Network Emerging Leaders Dialogue alumni as panelists here today, and I'll introduce them shortly. For those of you that don't know much about us, the OzPNG Network is a Lowy Institute project that has been running for 10 years with the support of the Australian government through the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. The goal of our network is to build links and understanding between Australia and Papua New Guinea, two countries that share close ties in history and geography. Our Emerging Leaders Dialogue is a platform for young people to contribute their insights and ideas towards the development of closer ties between Australia and Papua New Guinea. The Dialogue is the flagship uh, annual event of our network. In December last year, 20 young and emerging leaders from Papua New Guinea and Australia gathered at the Lowy Institute in Sydney uh, for our dialogue. Over five days, participants explored the theme of digital connectivity and focused on critical development and human security issues relevant to both PNG and Australia. Activities included site visits to Meta's Australian office, Google's Australian regional headquarters at Piemont, a reception with the keynote speaker the PNG High Commissioner, His Excellency John Carley, a panel with rugby league stars to discuss the role of sport in building ties and supporting community development. The group traveled to Canberra for meetings with government and academia. We co-hosted the annual Ralph Honor Oration with the Kokoda Track Foundation before returning to Sydney, to Sydney for a focus on media skills and a site visit to the ABC studios in Ultimo. So participants considered how PNG can develop its digital sector and the role of partners such as the Australian government, businesses and community organizations. We explored the digital theme from the perspectives of accessibility, affordability, meaningful connectivity, digital literacy, online safety, cybersecurity and gender. Participants developed recommendations for the Australian and PNG governments and the business community with the goal of improving links between the two countries. And that's the report that we are launching tonight. And there are copies on the table outside. I encourage you to, to take one or a few, as many as you can cram on your bag. They are free, but you can charge whatever you want for them. <laughs> the report captures the discussions over the course of that week. There is no single author. Um, there's no attribution to the contents. You'll see quotes and quotations throughout it. These are sentiments and comments that were made throughout the course of the week. Um, and what we'll do tonight is we'll explore some of those issues. And after we hear from our panelists, we'd like to open the floor to the audience if you might have your own questions as well. The discussion is being recorded. We'll publish this discussion and share it with a wider audience in days to come. Let me introduce our panelists. We've got Clara Kalma sitting right next to me. Clara is an Australian Papua New Guinean woman with roots in Central Province and Yule Island. Clara is currently employed at Grain Corp and along with her agricultural pursuits, she's represented Papua New Guinea in the 2020 National Women's Rugby 15 squad, the Cassowaries, and 2023 as well. And congratulations on that. <laughs> Must have gone pretty well. <laughs> In fact, the list of sports engagements uh, is quite long, so I, I think I'll skip to the end and say that Claire aims to, to create more opportunities for PNG agricultural ambassadors to meaningfully contribute to Papua New Guinea's agricultural development, and Claire will be speaking on sport and agriculture tonight. Jack Groudon, he's the guy in the suit, is the founder and CEO of Lighthouse International, 
an Australian NGO which has provided 200,000 students in Papua New Guinea, Australia, and the Asia Pacific region with digital learning tools and opportunities. It's probably more than that now. Just reading an old bio. So, <laughs> Jack will speak about digital education. And we have Sarah Bornstein. Sarah is an emergency nurse specialist based in Darwin. She has been supporting emergency care capacity development activities in Papua New Guinea for the past four years. Sarah's work contributed to the development and rollout of Kumul Health School, PNG's first digital learning program for emergency clerk clinicians. Sarah will speak to us about innovations in health. So without much further ado, I'll kick off the discussion by asking our panelists a few questions and we'll see where the night takes us. I'll start with you, Jack. In what ways can digital technologies enhance educational opportunities and bridge the education gap in Papua New Guinea, particularly for disadvantaged communities? Um, well, before I get started, I just want to acknowledge um, Mihai and the whole program that uh, we were a part of um, was absolutely terrific. Let's get that out of the way before we begin. Um, I've been a part of a lot of different sort of emerging leader programs and things like that, but this one was special in that it got a great group of people together. It connected us with people that, uh, well, to a varying degree, listened to what young people have to say about the Australia PNG uh, relationship and we had an outcome which is this fantastic report and um, it, it really is a terrific report and um, I think there's some great ideas in there and I hope that those that read it do take heed. Um, so well done to Mihai and the whole team at Lowy for, for hosting us. It was a fantastic week and great to be here. Um, look, to your question, uh, Mihai, I think, I think uh, I'm a little bit biased when it comes to this question. I think digital technologies are indispensable to everything that we do. Um, in terms of education, a quality education in today's world can only be digital. And the reason I say that is because nearly every profession that you have today, and certainly it's, it's heading more and more this way, any endeavour you attempt, you, if you want to learn, if you want to play, if you want to meet people, if you want to connect, you need to do it digitally to succeed. And so what I fear is that there is a generation of Papua New Guineans that are being left behind because if you go into classrooms across Papua New Guinea, there are not digital tools readily available and we're not cultivating digital citizens in the classroom. We talk a lot about digital government and I'm sure we'll talk a lot about you know, various, across various sectors, but you know, there, there's things about digitizing government services. There's things, I saw the other day quite a bizarre thing about digital voting, um, which I'll speak about a bit later on. If we're going to have a digital economy, if we're going to have people using um, online banking in PNG, if we're going to have um, you know, things such as digital education, digital government services, we're not going to be able to have a generation of Papua New Guineans actually utilising those services and leading the way unless they become digital citizens in the classroom. So I'm just going to tweak that question a little bit. It's not a bonus. It's not what's possible or what the potential is with digital technologies, it's that digital technologies are indispensable to quality education in today's world. Um, the biggest problem that I, I think schools uh, in Papua New Guinea face with digital education, it might sound a bit bizarre, is that a lot of the initiatives that are there to support them, they start with the sail, not the boat. They start with connectivity support. They forget about devices to get the most out of that connectivity. And so the work that Lighthouse International does is we provide um, computers into schools, 15 desktop computers into schools with an offline um, e-library um, uh, built in to the labs so that students can be accessing information that students all throughout Southeast Queensland and all throughout Australia have access to. Um, I think later on we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, where to start with this sort of, this sort of thing. But, you know, we, we need to start with devices. We need to address device poverty in schools. We need to follow a very similar path to what schools did in Australia at the advent of digital technologies, which is to get them into the classroom. Ultimately, um, digital is the future. It's the present, but it's also the future. And we have to remember that the students that are going through school right now, students that I've met at, you know, at length across places like Juwaka, Chimbu, Gulf Province, um, you know, they're going to be working quite possibly into the 2070s and the 2080s if it's a digital world now, imagine what it's going to be like then. And ultimately, we owe it to them to ensure that we enshrine digital technologies into the classroom and we accept that as, an, as a necessity, not a bonus. It's not what it can create. It's that it must be so. 
It must be so in, in exactly the same um, um, value that, uh, that books and pencils and blackboards provide. You know, we're in a digital world today. We need to get Papua New Guinean students to be on digital technology um, every day in the classroom, and it is possible. That's the most important part, and I look forward to sharing a little bit more about um, what we do and how we've made it possible in the most remote parts of the country um, over the last five years. So. Amazing. Okay. I love your fire. Hold on to that. Sarah, how can digital innovations in health contribute to improving access to quality healthcare services in remote and underserved areas of Papua New Guinea? It's a big question. <coughs> Sorry, I lost my voice today. Um, I think there are three main parts to that. I think there's education, which Jack's already spoken about. I think there's information and I think there's peer support as well. So on the education front, again, Jack's spoken a lot about sort of the infrastructure side of it. Um, but I think as well there's these learning programs that you can roll out, not in one location, but you can deliver it everywhere so that some of those smaller communities with maybe one doctor or a few nurses can then access the same learning that someone in the city can. Um, I was involved for the last few years rolling out the Kumul Health School program um, with support from Katapa, the learning provider, and um, DFAT and Australian College of Emergency Medicine, amongst others. Um, but I think the beauty of the program was that it was because of COVID, rarely will I thank COVID, um, but because of COVID we weren't able, the Australian team wasn't able to travel there. So we worked really closely with the local team learning how to do Zoom calls and how to develop an online learning program via Zoom. Um, and I think it actually meant that as much as it was very intimidating initially, the local team really took ownership of it and were really realistic about what could be delivered and assuming that we were not going to be able to get over there at all, what they were able to do. And they really took it on and were so proud of everything that was achieved. And then when it was rolled out, it became, I think, a lot more than it would have been had a bunch of Australians gone over and rolled out a program. So there's the education side of it that can reach more people. There's the information side of it. By collecting information, we have an idea of what is happening. It's applicable to all sectors, but particularly in health, I think. Um, COVID, again, has shown us that by having some health data, you can see where outbreaks are happening, how quickly they're happening, and you can allocate your resources accordingly. And in a low resource setting, that's particularly important when you're already stretched, you need to know where these, you know, you've already got a shortage of clinicians. Where should they be? Where should these resources go? And by having the data, you can use that. Um, I think as well, we had some involvement in developing data collection tools in some of the emergency departments. Initially, we were worried that clinicians would see it as extra work, but actually we found the opposite. They wanted to get involved. They wanted to prove how hard they were working and show how many patients they're seeing and what they're coming in with and how long they're spending with these patients. And the clinicians have then been able to use it as an advocacy tool with their managers to say, we need more staff because, you know, look at all the work we're doing and we can now show you in a graph or in a table and, and prove to you everything that we're doing. Um, so that's been really helpful as well. And now we're starting to see clinicians get involved in research opportunities as well which is so exciting for emergency care in PNG, which is a pretty young um, specialty in PNG. And then lastly, that peer support element, which I think, you know, is kind of an add-on to a lot of things, but maybe doesn't get the recognition that it deserves. I think it alone is incredible um, from a skills and experience sharing perspective, but also just a wellbeing perspective. Um, we've seen, particularly in the last few years, again, thanks COVID, um, there, there have been forums, particularly in emergency care, that's all I can speak to, but we've had forums with um, clinicians all across the Pacific sharing their experiences and learning from each other and it's not been someone teaching someone else, it's really been this sharing opportunity and to say, oh, we tried this and it worked, maybe you give it a go and everyone's coming on and sharing these amazing opportunities so that they're delivering better care but also they're saying, we understand what you're going through and then these clinicians that are, you know, in these tiny communities working by themselves, going through these incredibly difficult experiences, making these really hard decisions about life or death, have somewhere that they can jump onto a Zoom call and go, this happened yesterday. 
and I just want to share it. And, and for everyone to go, we can't fix this, but I get it. And I think there's so much that can be said for that as well from a wellbeing perspective. That's excellent. Thank you. Claire? What does digital technology mean for you and your peers? And do you see major differences between how young people use technology in Papua New Guinea and how it is used in Australia? I might tackle this from a sporting perspective. Please. No pun intended. Um, <laughs> but um, with the younger folk in PNG, if they have access to a phone, if they have data, if they have internet, um, it's a way that we connect and keep in touch um, with a lot of international sport and the way sport's progressing. Um, for all of the sports in PNG, rugby and women's sport, uh, which I'm a big advocate for. Um, that's how we keep connected and a lot of the teams now do have Australian-based players. Um, so we use, I guess, digital technology to keep in touch and also to progress our skills. So a lot of our management back home, I can speak firsthand experience that there's a lot of room for development and improvement. Um, so uh, Oceana Rugby and World Rugby, for example, sort of link in with the technology side and they'll help with our management and coaching to try and get them up to that skill level we're trying to progress to. So um, getting your certificates for coaching uh, foundation course one, two, whatnot, so then they can take it back to their clubs, bring that into the international corp and grow the game. Um, definitely lacking at the moment, but there's so much opportunity there and things out there from rugby union. I know rugby league, uh, they're a bit of ahead of the game with the backing support of the NRL here in Australia. So they have programs such as Team Up going into local communities um, within the country uh, for the youth and they try and advocate for things through their little fun games and um, educational purposes, I guess. So they'll tackle, I guess, gender-based violence and they'll try and teach the kids through fun activities um, while they're young. Um, I guess to just talk about important things that are challenging our our community and and culture, I guess, back there. Um, the differences between young people. Uh, we're super advanced here in Australia, obviously, growing up with it, having a phone all the time. And um, even in primary school, the transition to high school and, and to university, if you do choose to go, um, you're already taught how to use the basics. So back home in PNG, some of them totally skipped a whole generation. I know back when we had our Emerging Leaders Dialogue, we did talk about how um, they totally skipped a generation, boom, the iPhone's here, but no one knows how to even text or use certain things properly. So it opens up issues for things to get misused, people not using um, like social media and different things correctly. There's lots of scams and things out there people aren't aware of so um sorry this is going on a different tangent but <laughs> um so there is a big difference there I guess with how we use it but it is very important especially yeah and and with the young ones coming through um being a young leader in the women's sport in the progressive um international game it is very important to keep us connected and it is a challenge because we're not always together and we don't get to practice skills and whatnot, but it'll be a vital part of our, um, of us improving to the next level. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. My next question is going to be for Jack. Now we've heard some examples about formal systems, informal networks, um, the social nature of, of, of technology um, and how it can be directly applicable to the delivery of, of public services. But what do you say, Jack, to people who suggest that it's too early to focus on digital education in a country like Papua New Guinea and that maybe the focus should be on the basics? Um, yeah, I, I just would like to – I feel I shortchanged you on your last answer. I focused on the necessity of digital, not the power of digital. So just a quick story before I get on that, if that's okay. Um, recently I was in Juwaka. Um, in a school, uh, I think it was number 163 that we opened, a computer lab in the school. And um, while we were there, I looked on the shelf and I saw on a bookshelf there was less books on the shelf of the whole school than I have at home. There was about, I counted 45 books 
some of which I actually remember from when I was growing up, learning about dinosaurs and whales and things like that. That was I would have been reading those in about 2002, 2003. But one of the critical learning resources that the school had available was a encyclopedia. And so I checked the date of that, and it was 1978. And if you look on the wall, there's a map. I love maps. I thought, this is fantastic. Let's go and see what the kids are learning about. Oh, the Soviet Union is still on the map. That's a shame. So I want to I express the power of digital um, by just saying that we compare that encyclopedia, which is well outdated and needs to be replaced every year, to what we're providing with our fantastic partners, NewNet, for free at no cost to the schools, an offline e-library with the entire Wikipedia collection. 6.2 million articles on Wikipedia alone for free at these kids' fingertips. So sometimes we overcomplicate this digital thing. All digital is is the ability to minimalize an enormous amount of information that you could fill that Deloitte tower full of books and still not have 6.2 million articles. So suddenly at these kids' fingertips, they have information. And ultimately what we're talking about here with digital and what certainly Sarah referred to um, with, uh, you know, with, with, um, is the access to information. That's the key that digital allows you to proliferate information. And then there's the connectivity, connectivity piece afterwards. But information, if we talk about starting at the basics to your next question, this is the part people get digital all wrong. They get it all wrong. I, I cannot believe that we, that we have had to go to government programs that are trying to build digital capability in 12 high schools across PNG. They did everything but start with devices. They spent $8 million and there was no computers in those schools. Now, none of us here are tech entrepreneurs, I don't believe. If you are, I apologize. But common sense prevails in that to say that we need to start with computers. We need to start with the boat, and then we put up the sail, which is connectivity, which allows the sorts of things um, that have been mentioned before with connectivity. But first of all, we need the devices, because that's how you proliferate information. So to this point, you know, and I really don't know who makes those sorts of points, but you know, Digital technology is a basic in today's world. We consider it a basic. It's in your pocket. It's in everyone here's pocket. You know, we consider it a necessity. You don't leave home without your phone. So why is it good enough for you not to leave home without your phone? Yet for kids in Papua New Guinea, they don't get access to digital technologies at school. So the basics, I think, we, we get overly confused by digital technology. We think we have to go and have kids learning Zoom classes and doing all of these incredible things. The basics is just them using a computer them not being intimidated by technology when their first use of it is applying for a job at ExxonMobil. Just being able to feel it and touch it and understand the power of digital like we're talking about tonight and to have access to information that is a human right. That's the basics. So we start with that and eventually I think that the power of digital in a country like Papua New Guinea where you have 23 different provinces, you've got enormous cultural diversity, you've got mountain ranges that blow the mind, rivers and remoteness, Perhaps one day where we've got teachers that don't want to go and teach in Gulf province because there's no provisions there for them, where we've got schools that even don't have any teachers like the ones I saw um, on the Pereira River back in May, maybe we can have teachers teaching out of Port Moresby into classrooms digitally and we simply have facilitators around them. So it's happening in Bangladesh already. There's a fantastic foundation that does it. That's the sort of power of digital, but it doesn't have to start with that. So we have to be starting with addressing device poverty. That's the first step. Then you've got connectivity and then you've got ability. And that should be common sense. That should be taken as read. But unfortunately, it's not. And I think that's what lets down a lot of digital education initiatives is they go too far too early. Start with the basics. That's my thoughts on that. That's a good answer. I don't know who would throw a question like that at you. But it certainly wasn't me. Um, Let's explore another sector now. Let's talk a little bit about agriculture and what digital technology can do for that. Claire. Okay. Um, so my background is in Grain Corp, which is a global commercial company that export grain overseas. So not only based in Australia, all over. And I know we do send vessels to the Pacific. Um, just talking about that our company um, on the global footprint, I guess, we do have an opportunity to open avenues for workers to come over and help out. So I know we do have the palm, the palm scheme with workers coming for seasonal work. Um, the government's just changed something around to try and 
improve that and get more workers over, not just in agriculture, but in hospitality and other areas to upskill their professions. So uh, when they finish working here, if they don't choose to stay or whatever happens down the track, they can go back and take that skill back to P&G and improve um, different industries over there. So just talking about on the agricultural scale, I think there's a few different networks and companies around um, and government companies as well that help with trying to link workers to agricultural businesses and trying to get people over here to to upskill them um, and give them that little exposure to quality a different quality of life and just to to it's a bit of an eye opener I guess super different to being in P and G. Um, sorry. I'm <laughs> Do you think there are uh, tools that can be used in the agricultural sector that haven't been implemented or that are being implemented in PNG that, yes, that could change change the productivity for smallhold farmers, change their practices, um, engage with climate change um, adaptation yeah. initiatives? Yeah, so we have a few NGOs here in Australia that do agricultural development and aid work over in PNG. Um, I'm just going to talk about ACIA at the moment. They're one of the big ones um, that do a lot of work and projects over there and they fund a bunch of projects in regional areas and they get um, PNG students who are studying or people locally based um, to do little projects in their community to try and, um, I guess, see how better they can run their agricultural um, projects and at the end of the day, these small projects will try and improve the livelihood of the community. So trying to increase productivity, increase the gross margin that they're bringing back to the home. So at the end of the day, they might be, um, they can put that money towards more food for their family or maybe pay for education purposes. Um, so there are a lot of little projects going on and a lot of that is done digitally. Um, online, on the phone, if they have access. Um, there's a lot of Australian aid people going over to help out with these projects here and there, but they don't get to be there all the time. Just, I guess, same as Jack's perspective, he'll go and set that up, but he won't be able to be there to watch over and, and see the project through. So um, just having those devices to contact people and to ensure that they're um, getting the best out of their um, trials and research, whatnot. Um, sorry. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Now, Sarah, you mentioned COVID a few times. Um, as an emergency care specialist, can you talk us through how you use technology in an emergency health response in Papua New Guinea? And perhaps, if you could, what other scenarios uh, would healthcare workers in Papua New Guinea be planning for? We have the pandemic, but what else would classify as an emergency health response for them? Sure. Um, so we've used digital technology in a lot of different ways. I think a lot of it, I guess, that I've been involved in has been around education. Um, and obviously I'm a little biased about Cornwall High School being great because um, <laughs> I developed it. Um, but we did, you know, there was a, a COVID element to that and we did a lot of training about um, PPE and preventing infection. And I guess our, um, while it was COVID focused, we tried really hard to keep it as broad as possible as well um, because as much as COVID has been all-consuming for the last few years, we didn't want it to end there. Um, and also, as we know, Papua New Guinea has a lot of other health issues. Um, TB comes to mind. Maybe, yeah, it's a massive health issue and I think the clinicians that we were in touch with were a lot more concerned about TB than they were about COVID. So it was really great to bring a program, as with all the other COVID education, um, that teaches about, you know, general um, principles of infection control um, and disease management rather than just focusing on COVID. Um, so I think, yeah, for me, education has been the main one. But again, that community building has been really good. Um, and I think part of, for me, what I noticed with rolling out digital learning um, for the uh, most of our users, there were probably a couple who had been involved in digital learning before. For everyone else, it was brand new. And it was such a privilege to see everybody want to be involved in it and want to embrace it. But also some of those side conversations that we had, I think, were maybe some of the most useful. We were then having discussions about 
different ways you could use your phone, different things you could access, social media and how you can follow the WHO page and all these other really important pages, not just talk to your friends on Facebook. So I think it sort of opened up this world and then there are all these other like specific clinical tools that I will not bore you with, um, but that you can access guidelines and protocols and drug calculators and stuff that is quite specific to medicine but that people didn't know existed and certainly didn't know they could access from their phones. Um, and a lot of them are downloadable. So you can get into Wi-Fi, download the app or download the information and then you can walk away and be an expert because that's all we do in Australia. As much as we pretend to be geniuses, sorry to disappoint anyone that goes to a hospital, we are looking at apps. We are using calculators. We, aren't, we haven't memorised this stuff. We're relying on these resources. Whereas my colleagues in PNG all this time have been trying to remember things um, and there's just no need. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it kind of opens up a whole other world and then the research side of it as well. It's been really fun getting to watch people want to be involved in research and feel so proud. You know, you've gone from doing online learning for the first time to being published in The Lancet and watching that transition over just a couple of years is wild and has people excited and it's become not just, you know, something you have to learn and to get better at your job and, of course, everyone wants to provide better care, um, but it's become this real thing that people are proud to be involved in as well. Could I just add to that? Please. That's the information I'm talking about having access to, but also I just love hearing stories about people having access to digital tools for the very first time. I've had the privilege of sitting next to kids the very first time they've got this thing in front of them, they've never seen a device in their life ever before. And I remember one particular um, student at the Hagen T Primary School in the Western Highlands. Um, generally speaking, when we sit with the kids for the very first time, they're, you know, with all due respect to them, not great because it's just so overwhelming for them, you know. Um, but we take them through the basics. This is where the keyboard is, this is where the backspace key is. Um, which they call the bugger up him key um, in parts of PNG. Um, here's the space bar and so on. And so I'm working through the very basic fundamentals with uh, two kids on my left, one on my right, and I can't quite see what the gentleman over here is up to. And it turns out uh, my dad was there on the day and he comes up and taps me on the shoulder and he goes, Jack, you've got to see this, you've got to see this. I thought, all right, I better have a look. And I looked over and this student within 15 minutes of ever using a digital device in his life had written a full paragraph with capital letter, uh, you know, shift key, mastered, spaces, perfect, enter down key. He even changed the color of the text. He bolded the text. Then I can just briefly touch on my team in PNG. You know, Claire, you're right. Sometimes it did leave me with anxiety, leaving this equipment behind. What happens next? Now I've got a full team in PNG. So this is actually Papua New Guinea's driving change, not me going there and doing this. Um, all of them, if you looked on their LinkedIn profile, before they were technical assistants at Lighthouse International, they were subsistence farmers at Mount Kuta Ridge. So we've managed to train them. Um, we've managed, sorry, we've managed to give them the opportunity to train themselves on how to use and, and implement digital technologies. And now they're the ones that are installing and solving problems. So the point I'm getting at is there's this enormous amount of human capability that is trapped on the other side of the digital divide. We always talk about what we can do for them. What about their ideas? What about their talents? What about their capabilities? Well, currently they're trapped. And it's a simple matter of building that bridge across with resources. We can get their ideas, their talents, um, and their capabilities to be solving global problems. So we don't have to do it on our own. That's, I think there's a lot of talent that's there that's being lost across the digital divide. And we need to address that as quick as possible. You seem to be on a bit of a roll there. So I think I'll stick with you for the next question. What do you want to see? There's a partnership between Australia and Papua New Guinea, a lot of points of engagement in development assistance, diplomacy, people-to-people -people links, mm -hmm. economics, security cooperation. What do you want to see from the Australian side of that partnership? What do you want to see from the PNG side? And thinking about not just government, but what do you want businesses to be doing and community organisations to be thinking about? Well, I'm going to start from the bottom. There's some fantastic community organisations here in Australia, first of all. Um, I can think of Project Yumi, for example, great organisations that are on the ground moving resources from the haves to the have-nots. Huge generalisation, but that's the general gist of it. There's some fantastic NGOs doing great work in Australia. 
we'll, co we'll couple them into the community sector. And there's some great people to people links. I think there is a, an underlying respect between Australians and Papua New Guineans, um, you know, all in all. Um, but I do think, and, and in, when it comes to the corporate sector, I speak volumes of Papua New Guinea's corporate sector, the Port Moresby corporate sector. They're the ones that finance charities like us. They're the ones that get behind NGOs and drive immediate change straight away, direct, tangible, real change you can feel in the palm of your hand. So I speak very highly of the corporates in PNG, to be perfectly honest. But that's where it ends for me, because I think for the Australian government, we need to really, really, really have a good look at priorities. Um, the fact is that I've seen too many projects that DFAT has supported that just seem so critically devoid of common sense, like what I mentioned before. An $8 million project to build digital connectivity, to build digital capability in schools, and we don't have computers. I have a theory that maybe there's a few too many experts, a few too many consultants who spend a few too many hours at a whiteboard trying to solve problems that are pretty straightforward. If you think about when you had breakfast this morning, you probably, if you had cereal like me, you would have eaten out of a bowl. Looks like bowls did 5,000 years ago. You would have eaten with a fork and a spoon that looked very similar to what people in the Middle Ages ate with. We didn't need to reinvent that wheel because it, it works, you know? And I guess we need to start to borrow a little bit from the history of development that all of our nations have been through. All the nations of the world are on a development path. And if you follow and log their human development index scores, they follow a fairly similar tangent. And yes, of course, there's plus and minuses when it comes to culture and geography. They're variants, of course, no doubt about that. But by and large, we, as humans, we have universal needs and necessities. We all need the same thing. We're all human beings. And so we need to look at countries that have gone through that development curve, including our own. Once upon a time, um, you know, parts of Brisbane here, there would have been slums. There would have been uh, children not being able to go to school. There still is, of course. But by and large, Australia's escaped certain traps along those development lines. So why is it that when we decide, when, when we've already put computer labs into schools in our country, why do we suddenly, when we give support overseas, why do we throw that out? Why do we have to come up with new solutions for these things? It should be taken as read that children go to school. It should be taken as read that there is technology in those schools. That's my, obviously my, my issue, so I'm going to talk more about that. Um, but ultimately, I think we just need to simplify development. It's not that hard at all. If you look at the great development initiatives, they were infrastructure-based. They were filling critical resource gaps. We just overcomplicate these things far too much, far too much. That's, that's my honest opinion of what I see from uh, a lot of Australian government-funded initiatives. And to be perfectly honest, as an NGO um, that has grown from $20 from my best mate to being in the top 10% of charities by revenue size in this country, and we've built 173 computer labs in PNG, and DFAT has, and, 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 and many international development partners have been utterly invisible on that journey. Which brings me to the second stakeholder, who have been equally invisible, the PNG government. We talk about, and I'm not, it's not a political statement, this is governments in general. We talk about DFAT's priorities. If what we heard from DFAT in Canberra was true, their priorities are dictated to by those who have and hold the mandate of government. Well, if the priorities are to build digital capability in schools without laptops, we've got some problems. We need to get to the absolute basic grassroots of development. We need to build roads to move people and goods cheaper and easier to, to, to foster greater industry. We need to get children into schools because PNG has a youth, bulging youth bubble. And that's a liability at the moment. And the only way to move that to be an asset is to educate them. It's pretty simple. How do I know that? Because we did it. Because China did it. Because Japan did it. Because humans did that for centuries. And so I think we need to, we need to really um, just get back to the fundamentals. Stop going to a whiteboard to solve these problems. Listen to community development um, offices on the ground. Listen to local councillors in Papua New Guinea who live and breathe this stuff every single day. And, uh, and quite honestly, cut the nonsense. Get back to delivering real tangible results to people. If you can't build it, don't fund it. I think that's a fair start. All right. Well, we'll open the floor to questions from the audience. Uh, it's not a whiteboard. It's a, it's a bit of a town hall. 
Um, but if you have comments and questions, please uh, raise your hand if you could identify your affiliation, if you like, uh, and your name. Um, any questions in the audience? Sorry, I'm Paul, uh, Orange Digital CEO. We're part of Brian Bell Group. Oh, fantastic. Uh, um, you touched briefly on, on government uh, up there, and, and obviously you know, devices are critically important, uh, infrastructure is important, but you need government support to, to get it all off the ground. How much longer are we going to wait for energy government to, to really enact you know, digital policies and programs like we've seen with it? It's in Bangladesh, we use in India. Mm -hmm. Other third world countries, you know, particularly in Africa, that have, that have really enabled you know, the unbanked in the country to be able to get access to devices, the uneducated, etc. How long are we going to wait, and what are we going to do to really try and drive government action to, to understand that you know, digital technologies are um, critical for the future of the country? That's a great question. Um, I think it just goes to the point of the fact that other countries have been on these development journeys before. And so there's evidence out there so that we don't need to reinvent the wheel, we simply need to borrow from it. What drives the impetus for that, I think, is informed citizens. And that's what we're trying to do at Lighthouse International is to provide information to the future voters, the future citizens of the country of PNG. I think there's there's too much voter complacency. There's there's not enough accountability from, from the top echelons of government to the bottom. And like I said, pretty well invisible on our journey as an NGO um, through this through this um, through this space, so I think um, ultimately it comes down to the citizens of PNG to drive this change. It's not us; we're, we're outsiders. And I guess that's why I, I finish on the PNG government because ultimately, you know, Australia is a, is obviously the, a major development partner of PNG, but we're one of many. But ultimately, the mandate for delivering basic services falls to the PNG government. And I think perhaps you know I, I'm not a Papua New Guinean citizen. So I can't speak on, on, at all on their behalf. But as an Australian and as someone passionate about Papua New Guinea, maybe we need to hold it to greater account. You know, I, I, I am, I, as, as a CEO of an NGO, we're trying to register as an accredited NGO with DFAT. And the paperwork we have to fill out, the things we have to do, and rightfully so, because we're going to take taxpayers' money of Australian taxpayers here and we want to put that into programs. But if we're being held to such high account, what about the things that we actually do fund? Where's the outcomes of that? You know, we, we met as 10, uh, sorry, 20 Papua New Guinean and Australian emerging leaders and we had an outcome. It's in his hand. It's a report, which is, you know, we're raising money for Lighthouse International tonight at $15 a unit. Um, <laughs> we're most definitely not. But my point being is, you know, that's, it, it's an outcome. It's something. But I would like to see from that particular project where millions of dollars were handed over to build digital capability in schools, where's the outcome? Point to it. Show us an outcome. So there's not enough of that. It's, it's a very opaque space. And I think that is, is disappointing as well. As Australian taxpayers, we should know exactly where our money is being spent, particularly when it's in the, in the vicinity of $600 million. Um, but ultimately, I think it, it all falls down to citizens. And I was just chatting before, I, I, you know, I'm such an optimist for PNG. If we can convert that youth bulge into an asset rather than a liability, the country will, is going to have an incredibly bright future. I wouldn't, I wouldn't invest so much of my life if I didn't love and care and really appreciate and, and value the, the country's future. But ultimately... What I see is citizens becoming frustrated, very frustrated because, as Claire alluded to, I come home. I come home to a country where we do have basic services and where I do feel rewarded as a taxpayer somewhat. Um, but ultimately, it's going to be the citizens of Papua New Guinea who lose patience with government. And when that happens, when that really snaps and happens, it's not a good outcome. And I hope we don't see that in 10 or 15 years because a lot of countries that have faced a resource, uh, um, a re resource curse and a lot of countries that have stalled at certain points of the development cycle, it's happened to them. It's happened to them where there's been unrest or, or disorder and I just so hope that, uh, that it doesn't take that course and that Papua New Guinean citizens can hold their government to greater account because it must be so. And, and I, I, I hope that you know, anyone that's, that's in government on listening to this right now Get some boots on, go onto the ground, visit communities and listen to the people that put you there in the first place because it's not good enough and it has to change. However it changes, I don't know the answer. So Jack doesn't know the answer to that one. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from our audience? Please, sir. Uh, so Neil, I'm with uh, well, Snap Consulting. Um, so you, you mentioned 
in Africa and in Bangladesh a few times. So have we a few look at uh, what's happening in India and Africa? And I'm not talking about um, NGOs and what they've done. So uh, some example projects, but what innovations are coming out of those places? Because they both started down this path 10 years ago, and they're both technically very advanced parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's a, potentially a lot of learning that can be applied to those institutes, I think, in, and that some solutions that we're coming up with, I think, from Australian perspective, may not be as suitable. You know, uh, someone with a poor infrastructure, a poor connectivity is, an, is a problem, plus poor uh, um, power, um, no ability to maintain uh, technology to replace globalization. So there's solutions coming out of that which I think uh, is interesting to see what's happening there. So the question was for anyone who, who could didn't hear is, did the group consider examples from other parts of the world where uh, there are perhaps success stories that could be applied? Um, and, and I'll have a crack, and if anyone else on the panel wants to jump in, let me know. But um, it did come up during the course of the week, and I think the lesson there is also how we can identify those potential, uh, those success stories as potential solutions for Australian and PNG stakeholders. The focus for the week was the bilateral relationship, the relationship between our two countries, but there's a lesson there about networking um, and the sort of peer support effect that um, all three panelists spoke about. And I think with a little bit of connectivity and a few devices, um, the partnership can expand beyond just Australia and Papua New Guinea in terms of people that you do need a whiteboard sometimes, it's true. But um, it's not just about looking what's worked well in other parts of the Australian development program. Uh, as you said, it, it's about what's what are other countries doing for themselves? What are other communities altogether doing for themselves? So, you know, I'd say that all countries are at the beginning of this journey in terms of how governments and businesses engage with digital technology uh, and the communities that are their stakeholders. Um, and I acknowledge that it's probably not well known enough for someone working someone in Canberra working on PNG probably doesn't have enough visibility of what other people are doing in other parts of the world and, and I think the same goes from any chair that that you that you pick um, and that's a bit of a human foible but you know ironically it's technology that can help us overcome that and using the power of networks any other of my panelists want to jump in Claire before I give it to Jack um, I'm just gonna don't say. give it to Jack <laughs> Um, PNG is quite complex as well, so when we are dealing with these issues and um, getting digital connectivity and devices out, um, we just have to remember, like there's eight, nine hundred different dialects, it's so unique in different areas of the country, so you have to cult culturally appropriately um, put those things in place and, and get those out, so um, that's another challenge we face, so it is good to take... Um, history and different points from other countries and how they've rolled things out, but um, PNG in itself... Um, compared to the Pacific, like we talk about Tonga, Samoa, Fiji, they are super complex. So we can't just, um, here's just a spread of what we're going to do for the country. We have to be like super individualized and specific in how we're going to roll it out in each space. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I was talking about with the variance. You know, most countries will follow that same curve, but there will be plus and minuses. And you've got to expect that PNG is going to have probably the highest plus or minus because, as you say, a third of the world's language is spoken there. It's an extraordinary country. You know, it's an amazing place of diversity and not every solution floats. There's no doubt about that. Um, but I do think, yeah, it's a great point. You know, countries like India at the moment, they're growing at 7% per annum, their economy, um, and just proliferating basic services to people. I, I lived in India for a little while and I'm going back there for Christmas and that was, I think it was four years ago I was in India last. I can't wait to come back because uh, I can't wait to see how the country's taken leaps and bounds forward. But, you know, the power of digital, once again, is that these sorts of things are only a question away. You know, it doesn't, you know, the point with, with people in Canberra, I mean, we have internet connection in Canberra. We can search for these sorts of things. We can see what India is doing when it comes to digital banking and to expanding the, um, you know, the, the ID system, for example, right across the country. It's been one of the biggest things that India's worked on um, in the 2010s. But also things like um, Paytm, you know, Paytm went from being a little tiny startup in Bangalore to suddenly within about 
five months, every person in, in, in India was using Paytm. They were sponsoring the Indian cricket team. Virat Kohli's going out to bat with them on here. Five months ago, they didn't even exist. So there's so much, there's so much to admire about India and what they've been able to create. They really are the, the big developing nation of, of the era. So I think we must be looking at these things. And I think then, then we look at success stories in other countries. And as Claire alludes to, they can't just be copy-pasted. But they have to. It, then, then it's incumbent on Papua New Guineans to work out well. How do we integrate this into our into our ways and our and um and and, and work that out? But I think it would. Yeah, I, I I um it would have been great to touch on that a bit more for sure. And I think I was only saying to Laura, my colleague, before I came here, it'd be great to have an Australia X dialogue for every country in the world. You know, it'd be an amazing thing to hear some of the ideas that people are doing. But they're only a Facebook uh, post or a LinkedIn scroll away. These sorts of ideas. LinkedIn in particular. So I think we need to be constantly looking at what other countries are doing because at the end of the day, they are human and there are basic human necessities. It's not me saying that. There's 192 governments have agreed to the sustainable development goals. We're all signatories to them. We've all identified that's what we need for sustainable development. So we use that as a benchmark. What works in other countries will likely work in different contexts with little tweaking. So we should have more conversations about that, that's for sure. I think from a health perspective, there's some of that is happening, but I guess it's such a small piece of the pie. Um, but there's definitely lessons from other countries in terms of apps and things that we can use in health that are coming to PNG. Um, I think there's a lot of work in the health information space as well. Um, thankfully, the WHO is leading a lot of that as well and sharing those lessons, which has been really useful. Um, but I think it is definitely happening, but I think there's also um, a lot of people working in little bubbles and I think some of that is contractual as well where there's different projects funded for different things and I think it would be really great to see some of the bigger organisations looking more broadly at what 10 different little projects are they funding and could some of them be friends and learn from each other and share some of that and do you need to do the same thing separately 10 times or could you all work together and achieve more? So I think some of it is happening but I think there's definitely room for improvement as well. Any other questions from the audience? Please. So Maho from Law Institute. Uh, Mike, you mentioned uh, device poverty but PNG has some of the highest internet price in the world. Um, do you have any recommendations to the PNG government or developing partners on how to reduce or at least increase affordability? So the, the question for the rest of the room is uh, affordability. PNG has some of the highest internet prices in the world. What's the answer? I think it's, it's terribly difficult to solve the connectivity piece. I do want to get to another part of your question there, but the connectivity piece is a real challenge in PNG. Um, and, you know, we've got such a an enormous um, geographic landmass. People forget that about PNG. You know, we always talk about Australia being a huge country, but I drove the Highlands Highway in November and, you know, I needed a chiropractor on call for about a week after that. It's a, it's a huge country. And if you look at the most connected nations in the world um, digitally, you look at South Korea, for example, um, it's such a small landmass, you know, places in Europe. So PNG, it's always going to be a challenge. There's no doubt about it. I think what we need to, what we need to be looking at is things like, Starlink, you know, things that don't, that, that wipe geography out of the equation um, as much as possible. But I'm no expert on that. And there are plenty of other people that are experts on that. And I would, I would default to someone who would love a LinkedIn connection or two from people in the audience to ask these questions is David Valentine from NewNet, the founder and CEO. He, he's from Papua New Guinea and, uh, and, and Fiji, and he's a terrific guy and he's done a lot in this space. But my recommendation would be to stop thinking that this is to government, to stop only thinking about the online aspects of it. The schools in Papua New Guinea, when we first started at Lighthouse, there was th about 3,600 3, primary schools, not a single one had a digital classroom that was functional, could deliver education. So if I can focus back on my issue, we need to see that um, the power of digital is in the minimalization of information, that you can have 6.2 million articles in the palm of your hand. So first of all, let's use that as an asset. Let's go and get one of these boxes that Dave from NewNet has developed himself, a PNG startup, what an amazing story, um, and that doesn't need the internet. This is a totally offline solution. So you can just place it into a school 
um, and you don't have any problems. It's, it's a way you go. Kids have access to, to information. So there's a win. We tick that box and we move on to something else. Um, we're currently working on a solution at Lighthouse that overcomes the electrification issue as well. So it couples um, solar energy into a box that's the size of a suitcase and we can roll it out anywhere in the world, whether it be on a beach or in a mountain or by the river in, in Prairie in the Gulf, um, and we can have digital classes. But I think we've just, like I, I started with, simplify digital. Stop trying to get us get kids in PNG that have never used a device to be suddenly active digital citizens that are going onto YouTube and send, you know, going sending emails and being on Zoom. It has to happen incrementally. It can't happen overnight. But certainly the the, the low hanging fruit is this offline possibility, um, because even if you look, if we once again look to other other nations. Let's look at my part of the world in North Queensland. If you cross the Great Dividing Range, ta-ta Telstra. See you later until you get to Cloncurry. You know, so um, we have – connectivity will improve over the years. I've got no doubt about that. But at the moment, it's still a big challenge. And the ability to download content, as Sarah was saying, and be able to discern that in your own time later is really powerful, really powerful. So connectivity, I think it's it's the, the geography of PNG does not lend itself towards connectivity. Um easily but i do think that starlink and satellite internet is something that can be the future there but i think overall we need to focus more on digital capability and less on connectivity it's uh, we, we've had instances of this in um, in remote parts of queensland we've worked with nbn um you know the national broadband network uh where they've provided heavily subsidized internet packages to school to people in Arakoon. but what's the point because they don't have devices to tap into it. So as soon as we deliver devices, it incentivizes people to go, hey, I'm not going to throw away that brochure from MBN. I'm actually going to have a look at it. So let's get back to the basics with digital. That's That would be my advice. And connectivity will catch up later. I'm going to take the final question um, and throw it to each of you in turn. So what advice, I'll start with you, Claire, so you can hold on to that. Um, what advice would you have for a young person listening to this discussion tonight or watching it online in their own time, considering Papua New Guinea, considering Australia, considering the relationship, watching the discussion and wondering what is their role in all of this and how much power do they have as an individual to affect change? It's an easy question, yes, no. I think um, if there's youth watching us, um, well, I guess we're role models for these guys as well. So maybe they're aspiring to be bigger than what they've seen where they've grown up. Um, they might want to be a doctor. They might want to be a professional women's rugby player. They might want to be whatever they want. But um, digital connectivity and the progress with the digital world definitely will be a big part of their progression. Um, for educational purposes and, and whatnot, they're definitely going to have to challenge what's happening back home right now. Um, and there's a need there. And I think the youth are going to be the ones to yeah challenge that and, and push for, for better. Uh, people in our generation, I guess, I'm not going to say our ages, but... Um, they'll be the ones trying to push for that and the the, the ones younger than us, I guess, will, will really um, take that opportunity and, and run with it when, it when it does come. It's just going to take time, I believe, and it is coming. It's, there's slow progress there, but um, it's going to take time. But with the youth that I meet now here, even in Brisbane, like a lot of people who don't have that opportunity back home, they do come to Australia to study, to have that better quality education, to upskill and to... Um, get that professional aspect of whatever sector they want to go back to to take it back home to PNG. So um, people who do have aspirations to um, get educated or be professional in whatever they want to do, um, you do have to know how to use a computer and use a phone and um, unfortunately you have to have that digital connectivity um, headspace. So um, it is very important and... I think the people are going to have to push it if the government or people of power aren't going to be there to support it. We'll go to Jack next and then finish with Sarah. I split the question into um, Australians, young Australians and then young Papua New Guineans. First of all, young Australians, um, I think I often talk to people my age and younger now um, that, you know, we're the generation of unparalleled opportunities. That's what we're talking about here with digital. It's limitless. 
you know, we can meet instantly, we can message instantly, we can find things out instantly. So we have the privilege of having access to the most extraordinary tools with a generation of unparalleled opportunities. But I think we're also the generation of unparalleled obligation as well. We, can't, we cannot simply stand in the way. We cannot simply also get out of the way and abdicate responsibility for global issues. They are ours, they are our children's, and it's incumbent on us to do the very, very best that we possibly can, which I think previous generations have certainly done as well. Um, but it's possible. That's the point. I like that part, Mihai. It's possible. I was 19. I lived in Townsville. I played football on the weekends. I drank far too much. Someone like me was able to do this, and someone like me was able to start an NGO. Why can't, why can't others? And, but more importantly, not every um, young person that needs to go on to start an NGO, that would be the worst thing ever because we need people to be doing other incredibly important things. But how about we set a life goal as young people to be net producers for the world and not net consumers? So we, cre we, we create more than what we take. And if we're able to do that, if 51% of our population can be a net producer, not a net taker, which is not the case at the moment in society, then we would have a much better world and a lot of problems would naturally solve themselves. To Papua New Guineans though, I think as we were reflecting on earlier, it's terribly sad for me to see that there's a lot of negativity around PNG at the moment and there just shouldn't be. Particularly I see on Facebook all the time, I sit there and scroll through comments when I've got nothing else to do, lucky me. Um, and I see, you know, I, I see negativity around Papua New Guinea and where it's headed and whatnot. And I hope I didn't touch too much on negativity today because I truly believe Papua New Guinea is an extraordinary country. It's got incredible potential. The people are its greatest asset. The people are not a liability. They are an asset. We just need to make sure that the mass that exists in PNG, which is probably more like 17 million people, let's be honest, by the World Bank's report, we need to make sure that those people have the tools to exercise their creativity and their passion for their country. And I just, I just so hope that the public in PNG and young people in PNG start to see some change and that they don't become disenfranchised with the system and reject it. We can't reject the system. We have to change it. You can't give up. We have to look the problems dead straight in the eye. And so my, my advice to the young Papua New Guineans would be um, approach these problems knowing that you can make a difference and there are incredible Papua New Guineans here, um, you know, in the audience, on the stage and, and, and uh, throughout – my, my journeys, I've met them. Um, I think there's so much potential in that country. Let's start tapping it. And I, and I hope that the generation that goes through now that will live to see 100 years post-independence leaves behind um, a nation that provides greater reward for the incredible human endeavour that people put in daily in Papua New Guinea. So that less advice, more just keep going. Just, just try your best, do your best, and leave behind a better world than you entered. Yeah, I think that young people should know that they can play whatever role they want to play. I think it will be different for everyone and whatever people choose, there will always be challenges and there will always be people that say, oh, there's not enough internet so you won't be able to do that. There's not enough devices, you won't be able to do that. There's always going to be something, right? Even if you have it all, people just, oh, people won't want to do it. There'll be, there'll be challenges and it's navigating those, I think, um, and I think it, it starts with having your voice heard. And for some people that will be finding the confidence to express it, finding the words to express it. And for other people it will be having that but not having a path to express it and finding the person that has the influence to speak to the right people to get you where you want to be. But I think, yeah, there are always going to be challenges but follow whatever you want to do. Play whatever role you want to play. There's, the options are endless. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, before I wrap up tonight, um, I do want to put in a quick plug. So we have these three Emerging Leader Dialogue alumni were our panelists today. We have some in the audience as well. As you can see, there's a lot of passion, there's a lot of wisdom, um, and there's a lot of commitment uh, in the group. My plug is that next week, the Lowy Institute will open applications for this year's Emerging Leaders Dialogue, the 2023 um, AusPNG Network ELD. We're hosting the dialogue in Queensland, still working out the exact logistics, but it promises to be another RIPA program. So please keep your eyes peeled. 
Um, if it's not something that applies to you directly, try and think of someone that might benefit from the opportunity. Again, we'll be looking for 10 Papua New Guinean and 10 Australian participants um, under 40 uh, with a connection to the relationship uh, and with a passion for community in some way. We're looking for people from business, from pe people from government, student, artists, um, sports people, basically any and all sectors of society. So keep your eyes peeled for that next week. Um, and I Is there a theme for this year's? Have you figured it out yet? <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely, there is a theme. So this year we're going to be exploring what a First Nations foreign policy looks like for Australia and, and what it means for Australia's relationship with Papua New Guinea. Um, and we'll look at that from different angles as well, but we really want to um, capture the momentum behind that conversation in Australia and um, drawing reference to the current government's foreign policy um, pillar of First Nations foreign policy for Australia. So that's that's the theme. Digital will always be a part of, of this going, going forwards, um, but that's the lens that we'll be looking at it. Um, <laughs> If you have questions, please speak to me afterwards. Uh, I'm more than happy to, to provide more information. Let me finish by saying thank you to all of you that have joined us, um, and thank you to those watching online as well. For those of us here this evening, we have some delicious food that's about to be rolled out, so please stick around if you can, have another couple of drinks, continue the conversation, um, and I can hear some tummies rumbling in the audience, so uh, rest assured it's, it's, it's on its way and it's delicious. So thank you so much for joining us, uh, and please join me in thanking our panelists tonight.